Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. My name is Marie Wilson. I'm the branch head of the National Earth and Marine Observations branch here at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. Today's seminar is Time and Tide, Mapping Australia's coastal, sorry, Dynamic Coastal Zone Through Time and Space Using Digital Earth Australia, presented by Dr. Robbie Bishop-Taylor. Australia has a vast and highly dynamic coastline of over 30,000 square kilometres with many unique environments from sandy beaches to rocky cliffs, from muddy tidal flats to mangroves. Until recently, this scale and complexity has meant that many of Australia's coastal environments have been poorly and inconsistently mapped, particularly in dynamic or remote regions where accurate survey data can be extremely challenging and costly to obtain. In recent years, however, imaging satellites have provided a new and powerful source of information about Australia's coast and how it has changed over recent decades. The Digital Earth Australia program processes and offers these historical volumes of satellite data ready for consumption by governments and industry. Robbie will today demonstrate how new and innovative analysis techniques have been applied to the collection to provide a better understanding and ability to monitor Australia's vast coastal zone from space. Our presenter today, Dr. Robbie Bishop-Taylor, is a coastal earth observation scientist from the Digital Earth Australia program at Geoscience Australia. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Geospatial Science for research mapping multi-decadal surface water dynamics using satellite imagery. Robbie works as part of the team responsible for developing the first continent-wide maps of Australia's vast intertidal zone, which you will hear about today. And if you're a Twitter user, I'd encourage you to look Robbie up and follow him. He does tweet some amazing discoveries from Australia's coastal landscape. So just before I hand over to Robbie, I'd like to remind you that you can pop questions into the chat at any time during the presentation, and we will have some time at the end to answer a few of them. So over to you, Robbie. Hello, everyone. I'll just get my screen sharing. All right, I think you should be able to see that. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Robbie and I'm a coastal earth observation scientist from the Digital Earth Australia program at Geoscience Australia. Um, my background was um, has been using satellite data for mainly inland applications and so mapping water bodies through time, um, but I've since shifted to more of a coastal focus. Um, but all throughout my um, career, I've been my big sort of focus area has been how to use really large satellite data sets uh, to study how the earth is changing through time and space. So this talk will um, focus on the Australian coastline. Um, so we have a really unique coastline globally. Uh, we have a, the main, um, it's a key feature is it's an incredibly long coastline, about 30,000 kilometers long, depending on how you measure it. And that makes it about the sixth in the world, um, which is just a really immense um, environment. It is also a really complex environment. So it contains all sorts of different habit, coastal habitats, coastal landforms, um, everything from sandy beaches, um, muddy tidal flats, uh, rocky cliffs, mangroves, salt marsh, coral reefs. So there's a huge diversity of environments along our coast. And also this is the, the different, these different environments are shaped by uh, a wide range of different driving factors. So on the east and south coast of Australia, we have um, wave dominated beaches that um, are really driven by um, wind direction and waves. And up north, we have um, the very, very different tide dominated systems um, driven by tides, which are some of the world's largest. So we have pretty extreme tides up to 11 meters in some parts of Australia. And the other sort of interesting thing about a coastline is that it is divided into really heavily developed coastlines. So in our cities um, and along the east coast of Australia, about 80% of Australians live near the coast. Um, and the rest of the coastline is incredibly remote and inaccessible. Um, so this has sort of led to a situation where some areas of our coast are understood and mapped really well, and others are sort of at the moment pretty much left off the map. And this is because there's some big challenges with monitoring our coast. So the pure length of our coastline um, makes it pretty impractical to use um, sort of hands-on methods to monitor it. Um, so going out there and surveying it by hand is just not practical. There are methods such as aerial photography and drones um, that can take much bigger um, chunks of imagery and sort of monitor things at a bigger scale, but they are still incredibly expensive. So 
to fly um, aerial photography over um, stretches of coastline can cost anything from tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they work really well for high quality um, local um, and regional studies, but for scaling up to the whole coastal length, um, it's much more expensive and impractical. And the other, the other thing that is a really um, tricky thing is that our coastlines are some of the most dynamic environments on the planet. So compared to inland, where systems have generally seem to um, change more slowly, on the coast you have uh, huge amounts of change that happen on a minute, hour, day, month, um, yearly basis. So they're, sort of, they're constantly changing with tides, with waves, um, and sort of longer term processes, which makes it incredibly hazardous to survey because you never know what conditions you're going to encounter when you go out there. But it also means that we really need um, frequent surveying data because these environments aren't the same day to day, they change a lot. So, so we're in a situation where the places that need the most up to date data really don't get it. Um, luckily, there's a solution for this. So um, satellites have been up um, in space orbiting the planet, um, collecting satellite imagery from the early 70s. And so this has sort of created a, a, an amazing resource of data that we can use to start monitoring our coastlines. And the nice thing about satellite data, you can see um, some of the satellites orbiting the Earth on the, um, the animation on the right, um, taking, taking images as they go. The nice thing about this is that they, they capture data across the whole planet. So you're not just getting information for these really well studied um, areas that everyone lives, you're also getting data for the remote areas that are hard to access. And the especially nice thing about this is that agencies like um, NASA, the um, US Geological Survey and the European Space Agency has made this data freely available for anyone to use. And while being cheap is good just because you don't have to pay for it, it also, the really valuable thing is that this means that we can suddenly start to scale up um, our analyses and look at things at a far bigger scale than we could do if we were paying for individual chunks of images. Um, the downside of this though is that satellite data up until recently has been quite difficult to use. So this data is generally really large um, in the hundreds of megabytes to gigabytes for each individual image. It often has really weird formatting. So each image, um, different satellite providers format their data in different ways, which makes it hard to use. And it's also often locked up um, in various different repositories and different um, download systems. So actually accessing it and analyzing it has been really difficult. So the program I, um, I work in, Digital Earth Australia, is essentially tasked with collecting decades of satellite data across Australia and organising it into a format that is nice and easy to use um, for government and industry. And so we do this um, using freely available software. Uh, we use, it's called the Open Data Cube. And essentially we take all of, this image, all of these images taken through the last few decades and across the, the extent of the, co the continent and combine it into a nice, easy format to analyse. So in this slide, I can give you a little example of what this looks like. So on the right, we've got a whole stack of images taken at different times of different conditions. Usually they'd be hard to access and, and not um, georeferenced, not calibrated. What the Data Cube does and what Digital Earth Australia does is take these images, stacks them together nicely, applies um, calibration steps to each image to make them nice and consistent through time, and then organizes them into a time series. So basically you can, you can request, I want imagery from the last 30 years for Sydney, and it will stack them all up and give you exactly that um, in a nice organized way, which is takes a huge amount of the work out of it. Um, so rather than having to spend all your time collecting these individual images and processing them one by one, you can just request this entire stack. Um, this all leads to a huge amount of data. So in the Digital Earth Australia archive, we have about 35 years of satellite data extending back to 1986, and that's about nine petabytes of data. Um, and so that is the scale of that's hard to comprehend. That's if you imagine a 128 megabyte um, USB drive, that's 70 million of them. Um, so it's just really vast amounts of data and it's growing quickly. Um, we get new images roughly every three to four days between um, all of the satellites we have in the archive. And yeah, the key thing is that all of these images are analysis ready. So all of the hard work of processing them and aligning them and correcting them has been done. So you don't have to spend your time with this of the, the hard, um, slow, steady stuff. You can just get straight onto an analyzing the data quickly. Um, Unfortunately, though, a lot of this data isn't super easy to use straight off the bat. So even though it's been calibrated nicely, there's a whole lot of other issues which affect um, satellite imagery on the coast, which makes it hard to analyze and hard to get insights from. So you can see in this animation, um, as we flick through, you have things like clouds, which aren't masked from a data set. You have thin, hazy clouds, which aren't picked up by our algorithms. You can have 
um, breaking white wa water and waves on the coast, which um, make it difficult to work out uh, to see through and see what's going on beneath the waves. Uh, we have turbidity, which can change a lot um, depending on um, weather. And so that can sort of create everything from dark, muddy water to nice, clear, crystal clear water. And that changes how you analyze the data. Um, we have things like sun glint, which can lead the water to be incredibly bright and shiny and not useful data. But the really um, big one, which I'm going to focus on in this talk, is the effect of tide. And so you can see, if you glimpse between these images, you can see some of these images are taken at low tide. You can see these big mud flats up in the Kai. Uh, some are taken at high tide. And so if you don't um, correct for those issues, you suddenly get a really distorted idea of what the coast looks like because you're, you're trying to compare high tide images with low tide images, and it's really difficult to extract useful data from that. So we use two main approaches for dealing with these problems, which I'm going to focus on in detail in this talk. So the first sort of main approach we use is we try to um, take a stack of images which are really noisy and have all these sort of different issues affecting them. Um, you can see these on the left here. And using those images, we basically combine them, squash them together, and try to extract only the really nice pixels, only the really nice clear observations from each image. So taking a whole stack of, of nasty images and combining them into one clean image. So there's some pretty complex maths behind this, but um, this algorithm is basically called a geometric median. And all it does is it, it takes the median of this stack of images, and it uses some sort of quite um, fancy maths in the background to make sure that this image isn't just a pretty picture. It's actually exactly the same um, characteristics as these individual satellite images. So you can analyze this nice, clean image just in the same way as you'd analyze an image, except it's nice and clean and doesn't have all of the issues that are affecting individual satellite photos. The second thing we use, the second main technique we use, is we try to control for some of the variability in these images. So the biggest one that I talked about before was tides. Um, so what we can do is, taking a stack of images taken through time, we can then calculate, using a tidal model, the tide height at the exact moment each image was taken. So in this graph on the right, um, on the x-axis, this is time from um, the late 80s. On the y-axis is tide height. And each of these dots is a satellite image taken by a satellite during that period. So you can see that we have some images down the bottom which are taken at low tide, some are taken at high tide, and you've got all the way through the tide spectrum as you go through. So this is really cool because if we can add this tide information to our satellite images, that gives us a whole other dimension that we can filter our data on. So for example, we could take, if we're interested in high tide, we could look at just the highest 20% of satellite observations and we can pull them out of the data cube. Vice versa, we could look at just the lowest 20% of satellite observations. So we can sort of slice and dice images by tide height, which gives us, it suddenly lets you do all sorts of amazing analyses with them that wouldn't be possible if you didn't know the tide height. So this um, underpins those two methods, um, compositing, so pulling out nice quality images from a whole lot of um, noisy images, and tide um, filtering, underpins the, the first product I want to show you today, which is the Digital Earth Australia high and low tides imagery products. So basically what these are are images of the coastline produced from low and high tide images um, to produce these really nice, clean, beautiful um, composites of what the coastline looks like at low tide and high tide. So this is an um, example up in Talbot Bay in the Kimberley. Um, you can see this image is beautifully clean. You wouldn't get anything as clean as that if you're looking at individual images. We've filtered out the best pixels, and then we've also filtered the low tide. So we can zoom in a little just to compare what these look like. So on the left is the high tide composite. It's produced from just um, images taken at the highest 20% of tides. So you can see here um, the water goes all the way up to these really steep cliffs in the Kimberley. Um, however, if we do the opposite and we pull out just the low tides on the right, you can suddenly see all this extra detail emerge. Um, we can essentially kind of see through the water that would normally be there and just look at these features which only emerge during low tides. So you can see there's a big sand banks down the bottom, these um, rocky intertidal reefs which are usually submerged. So this kind of data, being able to filter um, to different tidal stages is really valuable for, um, for starting to map um, the, sort of the coastal habitat which is really important for endangered and threatened migratory species in Australia. Um, so this is some work um, by a colleague of mine um, who basically did a similar approach, pulling out um, certain portions of the tide range and then looking at that through time and use that to start mapping um, the, sort of the, the changes in some of these habitats which um, inject these migratory species use. So we've got down the bottom, you can see the emergence of a mangrove island that's sort of appeared over the last 30 years. Um, and the nice thing is that these images, because they are computed with that geomedian um, 
algorithm I talked about before, these can all be analyzed like any satellite image. So you can do habitat classification, you can do machine learning on them, you can sort of start to get really detailed information about how these habitats have changed through time. And so by controlling for tide, you suddenly get rid of a huge amount of variability that would normally make this very difficult data to use. So we can go a step further though. So the previous products were just looking at low and high tide images. Now, um, there's no reason we can't also pull out images throughout the entire tide range. So here you've got, um, we've essentially taken all of our satellite, 30 years of satellite imagery. We've tagged each image with a tide height and then we've sorted them by tide. So we can basically animate how the, the, what the coastline looks like as the tide goes from low tide to high tide and then low tide and high tide to low tide. And so the cool thing about this is that you can see as the water, um, as the water rises up, you can see how the coastline changes. So the coastline shifts in shape and structure as the tides change. And so that's really useful information because we can use that to start um, getting a better idea of the, the shape of the coastline at, across the tide range. So in the previous images, I showed you how we just pulled out the lowest 20% and the highest 20% of tides. In this case, we're actually gonna pull out tides across the entire tide range. So each 10% of the tide range from low tide to high tide you can see these different colors represent the different percents of the tide. So if you map that spatially, we can get something like this, where each of these represents a different portion of the tide. You can see how um, we're going slowly up into high tide from low tide. Um, and it sort of gives you this really nice idea of what the coastline looks like as the tide increases. And so this is all using a, um, a similar composite based approach to get these nice clean um, individual data sets. If we were using individual images, this would be a lot messier, but because we're sort of pulling out just the nice data from the time series, we can get a really nice clean result. And so some of these, um, these results are pretty beautiful. Um, this is in Roebuck Bay uh, near Broome and um, Exmouth Gulf. And you can see that the, the valuable thing about this is that depending on what tide you're looking at, so whether you're looking at low tides in red or high tides in blue, you get a really different idea of what the coastline looks like. And you can imagine that depending on your application, this could give you very different results. So say if you're someone who is looking to build infrastructure near the coast, you're probably interested in the high tide line. Um, whereas if you are interested in um, feeding habitats for migratory birds, you're probably interested in the low tide. So by combining satellite imagery with tide heights, you can suddenly get much more insight than just looking at the images on there in isolation. So the advantage of, of this product is that it gives you really nice relative. So you can, you can for each location around the coastline, you can see what areas are, are exposed during only the lowest tides, what areas are exposed during only the highest tides. But the problem is that um, it is a relative model. So it's looking at percents of the tide range. And if you were to compare 10% of the tide range in Sydney, where you have a tide, of, tide range of only about one or two meters, that's gonna look very differently from a tide range up in Broome, where you've got a, a tide range of about 10 meters. So what we can do is um, taking this data, we can then convert these relative um, intertidal extents to something that's absolute. And so this, what would be really cool is if we could convert this data into elevation, because that's something that you can compare anywhere. Minus one meter elevation is gonna be the same in Broome, in Sydney, in, in Brisbane. And so, so the next phase of this work has been trying to take this um, relative model and then convert it into something absolute like elevation. So the way we've gone about this is that taking this model, we've extracted contours along the boundaries of each of these extents. And because we have tide modeling for each of these, all the images that went into each of these layers, we can then assign each contour with a tide height. So you can see here on the bottom, the lowest contour is about minus 2.5. In the middle, it's about mean sea level. And in the highest one, it's about 1.5 meters. Using that data, so these are contours, just like you'd see in an elevation map, we can interpolate between them, sort of smooth between the lines and get an actual elevation data set. So in this data set, um, which is called the DEA Intertidal Elevation Product, we can, these, every single pixel in this data set represents a tide height um, and an elevation that you can, you can put in the map and compare to other elevation data sets. So we've done some validation on this. Um, so the, the, the moment that sort of get the gold standard for measuring elevation along the coastline is LIDAR data. So from a plane, they, sort of, they use laser scanning to work out the elevation of the coastline. Um, and so what we found is that if you compare our results purely from a tidal model and satellite imagery to LIDAR, you get some really encouraging results. So we're getting accuracy of about 40 centimeters compared to LIDAR for sandy beaches and tidal flats. A little bit less in rocky shores. Um, and so one of the biggest problems we've had in rocky shores is that um, our model only works as well as the tidal modeling works. And in some of these rocky shores up in the Kimberley, you get water left on these rocky platforms after high tide. Um, and it sort of just lingers there for many hours afterwards, slowly draining off. And that sort of really messes with our model. 
So there's still some there's some issues in some of these places where the water doesn't follow nice tidal dynamics, but for sandy beaches and tidal flats, we get really nice results. And so this has now been scaled up across the entire coastline of Australia. Um, so you can see an animation here. Um, this is all 3D data that comes purely from the tidal model and satellite data. There's no direct measurements of the coastline. Um, and so this is now, for a lot of Australia, pretty much the first source of elevation data. So this is really great for these really remote areas that aren't going to have the attention of people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly planes over to collect more detailed data. And so we, just to visualize this of the, how these um, products were generated, you can sort of see here we've animated the rise and the fall of the tide over the elevation model that we produced. And you can sort of see how these, at low tide, these big sand flats, which is about five kilometers or 10 kilometers long in Roebuck Bay, um, emerge out of the water at low tide and then get submerged as the tide rises. And similarly, in, um, in Bino Harbour up in the Northern Territory, you can see these really immense sand flats that would normally be hidden under the imagery. So you normally couldn't see them, um, or you'd see them in only a couple of images. So this method is really powerful for pulling out this 3D topography that um, is normally sort of compressed in these images and hard to find. So across Australia, um, one of the first big applications of this has been trying to fill gaps of elevation along our coastline. So this is work done by Rob Beeman um, from JCU and um, the Australian Hydrographic Office. And the problem that they had was that along, they've got pretty decent data for deep water, pretty decent data for on the land, but along the coastline is often a gap of elevation data because it's just a really hard place to survey. And so they've used, um, they've combined the DA into tidal elevation into their models. And for the first time um, ever, Australia has nice continuous elevation data that extends at high resolution from the top of the mountains down to the very bottom of the ocean trenches. And that's really valuable for all sorts of applications, such as habitat mapping and also predicting storm surges, the effect of tsunamis, things like that. Further afield, um, it's been really exciting to watch some of these um, techniques be applied internationally. And so these are some examples from the UK Hydrographic Office's coastline mapping projects and the Scottish Government's dynamic coast projects. And so both of these projects have um, have pulled out coastlines at various tide heights, used that, interpolated that to produce nice smooth elevation surfaces and intertidal extents and low and high tide images. So it's been really exciting to see these techniques start to um, spread around the world. And it's a, an example of how powerful open source science can be that you can publish um, methods and tools for one location around the world and then have them scaled up and used around the other in other places pretty easily. So there's a few key limitations though of these products. So one of the, the really nasty ones is that um, satellites like Landsat that we use, they basically fly over the, the earth at the same time every, every time they come over. So this is, they come over around between 10 and 11 a.m. And that's to make sure that they get nice sunny conditions and also there's less clouds around that time. So it's just, it makes sense, but they always come over at the same time. The problem with that is that for some places in Australia, you simply never get low tides at 10.30 a.m. in the morning. And in other places, you simply never get high tides at 10.30 a.m. in the morning. And so this means that for some of our locations, the satellite images that we get of the coast aren't actually the lowest tides you can get or the highest tides you can get. So you can see up in Queensland here, all of these dots are clustered at the top. And the satellite just simply never takes photographs of this lowest portion of the tide. Same in the opposite in South Australia, where the satellite takes nice low tide images, but never catches the top of the tide. So this makes it quite difficult to compare the results across the continent because you, you don't know whether the extent of the tidal range you're seeing is true or whether it's just simply because the satellite doesn't see it at that time. The other sort of um, really tricky thing with these data sets is that it takes a lot of data to produce these nice smooth results. Um, so to get high quality elevation data, we need to use about 30 years of satellite imagery. Um, so the full archive of satellite data that's available to us. And what that means is that we, these are basically static data sets. They're, they're produced once off for the whole time period. And there's no ability to measure um, change. So you, we have flagged areas that we know are changing, but basically we have to say that there's no good data here. You can't use this product in this location. You need to find some other way to do it. But it would be really valuable to have information about how our coastlines are changing because that's so important for mapping, keeping maps up to date and sort of getting a better idea of how our coastlines are shifting and might shift in the future. So products like Digital Earth um, Australia Intertidal Elevation, at the moment it looks at a whole range of tide heights for a, a whole long time period. What we can do instead is we can flip this. So instead of looking at lots of tides for a single time period, we can instead look at lots of time periods for one single tide. 
And by doing this, by controlling for tide, we can suddenly get really nice comparisons um, between each of these different time steps that aren't affected by tide. So you don't, you're not, for example, looking at a high tide in one image, a low tide in the other. We can control for tide and get a nice consistent view of how the coastlines are changing. Um, so the, the first question in this, the, sort of the second phase of work was to work out what tide we want to look at. So if we're going to look at one tide through time, which one makes sense? Um, and I talked about in the previous slides how high and low tides aren't always captured by satellites, which is a really tricky problem. Um, so we basically can't, high and low tide really aren't a suitable tide data to use for this, but mean sea level is nicely captured across the whole coastline of Australia. Um, so you can see in here, mean sea level, there's lots of images all the way through, and that's pretty consistent along the coastline. Um, so we've used mean sea levels as our for this, and it's, it's also a pretty well used um, datum for monitoring coastal change. So it's actually quite, quite convenient and also a quite useful datum to use for, for looking at coastal change through time. So our method for looking at um, changing coastlines, essentially we take a whole stack of images, so it's often about 20 to 30 to 40 images per year. We mask out clouds, so we just look at the, the clear um, pixels in each image. We then use tide modeling to calculate the tide height for every single pixel in the image. So it's quite a lot of computation behind this. Um, we need to work out for every single pixel what the tide was exactly when each satellite image was taken. And then using that information, we can discard low and high tide images. So we can, pixels, sorry. So we can, for each of these pixels, each of these images, we can drop out all pixels that were captured at high tide, all pixels that were captured at low tide, just leaving this of the middle section centered around mean sea level. And so then using that data set, this tide mass data set, we can then combine them using a composite approach and get one really nice noise-free clean image that represents coastal conditions, um, so typical coastal conditions for that year at mean sea level. So taking that image, we can then convert that using some remote sensing techniques to a map that shows you where um, the distribution of water and land. And then we can use a, um, a, um, a pixel extraction method um, we developed um, a few years ago to extract the boundary between land and water. So this is, um, the, the important thing here is that, well, one of, the, one of the problems with automatic satellite methods for extracting coastlines is that along the east coast of Australia, we really don't get much change. So all of the change is concentrated in the 20 to 30 metre um, width of the beach. What this method does is it uses subtle differences in the wetness and the dryness of each pixel to try to position this line a bit more accurately than the satellite data. So we get out of this um, theoretically a really nice high quality line that separates land and, and water. But part of the uh, sort of a pretty important part of this project has been trying to make sure that the, the lines we're drawing on the map actually reflect reality. So we've been over the last few years gathering up a, a pretty um, large set of validations out there across the Australian coastline. And so we've been working really closely with um, state governments, local councils, um, research groups, and citizen science projects to collect all of these data points that have been monitored across the coastline over the last 30 years. So you can see these black dots. We've got to stretch a lot of coverage of the east and south coast, some data up in the west um, down in Tassie. So it's a really sort of a, a pretty powerful data set because we can use this to start comparing to our, our satellite derived satellite um, shorelines and just ensure that what we're mapping is actually true. So thankfully, um, after doing some of these comparisons, we've got some pretty good results. So up the top, you can see a comparison between the, um, our coastline data on the right here and um, more detailed data that's collected by the WA government using um, aerial photography methods. So you can see how the general patterns are pretty similar, but also the trend is very similar. And the trend is really what we're interested in because we want to make sure that we can if our product says that the cosine is changing by X amount, we want to make sure that that is actually true. The other, the other nice thing though, is that you can see that um, the satellite derived data, because we can get um, a satellite shoreline for every year in the, in the data set, rather than just occasionally, we can get a much richer idea of how the cosine is changing. So when you're flying planes over, you have to um, think about how carefully or the timing of these flights, because you've only got a limited amount of money to spend and these things are really expensive. Whereas with the satellite data, you can pull out similar results, but with a much more um, rich time history. And that's really important for working out whether, for example, things have changed consistently through time or whether there's been sort of step changes associated with management or um, development on the coast. The other, the, the second um, really encouraging result we've had is that uh, if you look at um, validation data for some of our really steep beaches, um, our steep wave dominated beaches, you can see that we're following the trends really, really closely. and on these graphs, the gray bar represents the size of one satellite pixel. 
So all of this change that we're picking up is happening within the size of one pixel, which is pretty powerful because it means that we can start to look at quite small scale change at a scale that's relevant to coastal management in Australia. So for example, some of our results, um, the accuracy is, is incredibly good down to about three or four metres. Generally, it's not that good. It's um, accurate to around 10 to 15 metres, depending on the coastal environment. But um, even that is showing that we're still getting results at better than the resolution of the satellite, which is, opens up all sorts of other applications. So this um, is all leading into a product that we've just released um, about a month ago called DA Coastlines. And so this product contains three sort of main layers that help you understand different um, aspects of the coastline. So here is the, the main, this is the, the most detailed layer, which are our annual coastlines. So each of these lines represents the position of the coastline at mean sea level for a given year. So you can see um, in this um, area just west of Bustleton in WA, we've got coastlines that are a, eroding backwards towards the, um, the settlement here. Um, and we've got, in other areas, we've got coastlines which are growing out to the ocean. So you can sort of see how you can see these patterns um, in quite a bit of detail, and you can get a really good idea of how these coastlines are changing. So we can use this data um, to start calculating actual rates of change. So if you're living on the coast, you're probably interested in how many um, metres the coastline is growing towards your house each year. Um, or if you're looking at habitats, you're probably interested in how many metres of extra habitat is gaining in each year. So we can convert these to, um, to rates of change statistics. So for example, over here, you've got um, coastlines which are moving inland by about six metres a year. And over here, you've got coastlines that are growing out to the ocean by about two metres a year. And the other thing we can do is we can also, based using a time series of data, we can start to attribute these rates of change with an uncertainty. So you can see here, we've got, um, while it is moving in um, inland about six metres a year, we've got a, a plus or minus about half a metre. So it, this sort of helps add some confidence to what we're seeing. So if you see um, coastal change measurements which have a really big error bar, you're probably less likely to trust them. If you have ones that have a quite small error bar, like on the right here, you know it, we can be pretty confident that the coastline is changing in that direction. So zooming further out, we can then take these points and we can summarize them at bigger scale. So here we've got a, um, a continental part of our continental summary, our hotspots of change um, layer. And so you can see here up in Van Diemen's Gulf in the territory, you've got these really red areas which represent coastlines which are eroding rapidly. And you've got a whole bunch of blue areas which represent coastlines that are growing. So this layer gives you a really nice idea of how everything is changing, how the difference of the eroding areas relate to the growing areas and gives you a much sort of more comprehensive view of how coastlines are changing in Australia. So this has been done um, for the entire Australian coastline. Um, so this is brand new results that um, we have in review at the moment on the right. And so each of these areas is red, meaning um, erosional hotspots, blue meaning um, progradational hotspots or growing hotspots. And you can see in these little charts, you've got these big spikes. Um, so this is the example I just showed you in Van Diemen's Gulf, which is a really big erosional hotspot. So we've done, um, we've looked at this at a continental scale and our results have shown that um, somewhat surprisingly that most of Australia's coastlines are reasonably stable. So there's been some previous research at global scale, which has hinted that Australia's coastlines are changing really rapidly. Most of our coastlines are actually pretty stable overall, about two thirds of them. However, about one third of them have grown um, significantly over the last 30 years. And of those changes, the majority has been retreat. Um, but there is a huge amount of variability. So across um, these environments, you've got areas of a very quick retreat, areas of incredibly quick growth. Um, and so it's, it's a very complex, these are very complex systems that don't just change in one direction. So they're not, they're not all moving backwards or forwards. Um, there's a lot of complexity in here. So um, I'm just gonna show you a little example, um, a little run through of some of the, what this data looks like in a few different locations. So um, this is the first one I showed you before at Point Stewart, Northern Territory in the Van Diemen's Gulf. And in this location, there's basically a 100 kilometer hotspot of coastal erosion. So you can see these coastlines retreating backwards pretty rapidly. And this can be as fast as about 15 meters a year, which is really, really significant. And in some of these locations, there's some amazing patterns where you can see basically the mangroves haven't kept up with the changing coastlines and they've sort of been marooned out into the ocean as the coastlines moved away from them. So there's these sort of just incredible scales of change happening up in this part of the territory. On the opposite, um, the opposite hand, we've got um, in Twilight Bay in Western Australia, we've actually had really fast growth over the last 30 years. So um, in this location, this beach has grown by about more than 500 metres over 30 years, which is just amazing. And the, the fascinating thing about this one is that this beach was actually really stable up until about 1995. And then suddenly this, um, this environment just zoomed out. 
Um, yeah, so by having this data and this temporal data through time, it really gives you a nice idea of how these things are changing and potentially, so we don't currently understand why this has occurred, but now that we know it has occurred and we know exactly the year it started, um, other scientists can come in and use this data to better understand these systems and why our coastlines are changing as they are. So that was a growing and a retreating example. A lot of the coastal change around Australia is much more complex than that. So here we've got a, um, a sand spit in Burbara Island in Queensland, just north of Bundaberg, that over the last 30 years has been slowly extending um, towards the west. And then we also capture a breach of the, um, the sand spit in about 2006, where this section just here um, breaks through and then that sort of changes the whole dynamics. So by having this sort of rich temporal data, we can get a much um, more, um, yeah, a much richer idea of how our coastlines are changing and then use that to work out why they're changing as well. So you can also, you can break this up, so we can animate it and we can break it up to get a better idea. You can see here how the, the spit is slowly extending up until about 2005, and then it breaks through and you have suddenly all these different geomorphic processes um, as this sand is slowly welding back onto this shore um, with the sediment flow. So for um, the last few minutes of this talk, I just wanted to give you a bit of a live demo of what this stuff looks like and how you can also use these products um, in your own work. Um, so all of, these, um, all of this work and all these products are av freely available online. Um, so anyone can access these and use them and zoom in and try to look at areas of coastline around you and see what the data looks like and potentially use it for your own work. So this is on a platform that we call Digital Earth Australia Maps. And so here we've got um, basically an archive of all of our satellite data, all of our coastal products, all in one spot on this interactive map that you can zoom through and have a look at and inspect areas in more detail. So when you open this up, you'll get a little story that um, introduces the coastlines product. It'll then walk you through the different layers. So it'll show you the, um, the continental summary. So the all of Australia map, we can zoom in further and get these sort of the more regional summary. We can zoom in even closer and get these rates of change points here. Zoom in closer again and get the actual underlying coastlines. And the, the nice thing about this is that this data is available for the whole coastline. So you can, you can zoom to any place that we can go into um, into Perth, for example, you can see some sort of pretty amazing sandbar dynamics. So here, sandbars have been slowly shifting to the east over time. We can see the um, the influence of coastal infrastructure. So here um, in Port Geograph Bay, in the um, early 90s, they built, and early thousands, they built these um, big break walls for a marina. They then found that there was problems with sediment um, and seaweed being caught on the um, the downdrifts, the updrift side of the marina and then the sand eroding on the north, which we can see here. And so then they had to basically pull out those old break walls and reconfigure the whole marina. And so you can see these, this, all of this change occurring and you can also see how the coastlines have responded to the change. So this is really valuable data for um, coastal engineering and coastal development because you can go back in time and see how past developments have changed the coastline and use that to inform future developments. And finally, you can also get, um, if we zoom out a little, you can also click on any of these points and you can get um, quantitative data and a graph of how the coastlines change. So if you have an area of beach near you that you've thought has changed over time, you can zoom out, click on these lines and then get um, a nice graph to show you how it's changed through time and also the rate of which it's changed. So that is the coastline product on DA Maps. Um, we can also add in some of our other layers. So for example, we can add in the low tide satellite image here. That will just take a second to load. We'll zoom out to somewhere interesting. So what this um, gives you is a, effectively a very um, similar to Google Earth um, where you can zoom in and zoom out and look at things in more detail. So here we've got a um, low tide image for Roebuck Bay. You can see these really beautiful tidal flats, sandy tidal flats out into the ocean. We can then look at the equivalent in the high tide image and you can see how the coastline radically changes between low and high tide. Um, so there's a high tide image and there's a low tide image. And so this kind of data you could use for habitat mapping, you could use for um, just getting a better idea of how a coastline shift and change through the different tidal stages. And then finally, you can also add in the um, intertidal extents for the same location. You can see here going from low tide to high tide and then as a final one, you can also add in the elevation data here. So you can click on this and get back information, elevation data about the coastline. So here we've got this one meter elevation. Here it's a bit deeper down to two, minus two meters below mean sea level. 
yeah, so all of this data is available on here. You can you can browse and scroll and add any combinations of layers you want. Um, for people that want to go a bit further, so this is great for just browsing the data and viewing the data, but if you actually want to analyze it and incorporate it into your work, we also have a, um, a really well documented um, guide to getting started with DEA. So all of the satellite data can be accessed um, online from a browser using a thing called the Digital Earth Australia Sandbox. And so what this is is basically a, a browser-based analysis environment where you can go in and you can test um, little examples of workflows and see if your ideas um, can produce nice insights into coastal change in Australia or, or this of the different environments in our coastline. So if you follow this guide, there's instructions for signing up. And then deeper in the guide, there's also really good worked examples of how to actually do this. So for example, if you're interested in monitoring coastal erosion and the product that we've produced isn't quite right for your application, you can work through this code, make some tweaks. So for example, you could choose a different time range, you could choose a different um, portion of the tide range and get something that is really customized for your area um, that's exactly what you want. So we're sort of, our pre-existing products are sort of, a, a, there's compromises built into them to get something to work for the whole of the continent. But if you want to get something that's tailored for your site, um, you can then do that too. And all the instructions are online. So jump back to the slides. So yeah, so all of these, all the instructions are here for how you get started. Um, and yeah, so essentially we, we are also continuing to develop these things. Um, we are really open to new ideas. So if you've seen any of these products and you have ideas for how you could use them or future ideas for development, we'd really love for you to get in touch. There's so many things. When you have satellite data in a nice organized way and you have tide modeling to supplement that, there is a huge amount of um, different amazing applications you can do with it. So we're really excited to keep exploring this stuff. And yeah, we'd love if you can get in touch with any questions you have and any ideas in the future. And that is all from me, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, in your graph of the tide heights and the satellite images, there was a gap between 2012 and 2014 in the satellite images. What was that from? Yeah. Um, so as over the, the decades have gone on, these satellites have got older, um, they've had various problems. So I think um, in that period, I'll just jump back to here. I think these ones, they show it. Um, one of the satellites that had been up um, for 20 years had was starting to be decommissioned. And then another satellite that was brought online failed um, for a short period. Um, so there's basically a gap in the data because the satellite stopped collecting data and it took them a, a few months to get the systems back online. So that's some of the problems we have to deal with. For certain, for certain time periods, this is a worse problem than others. Um, we have, in some of our more recent work, we've used extra data that we hadn't used in previous products. So um, in this period, one of the satellites got these big stripes through it, which makes it really hard to analyze. We hadn't used that in previous ones, but in the Cosun's product we have, because we wanted every bit of data we could get. But yeah, there's all sorts of problems with these satellites. They go up, they do a really good job for certain periods of time and then have issues, and you just have to work around them and find the best ways to get value from those, the existing data you have, because you can't go back in time again anymore. Cool, thanks Romy. Uh, next question, how sensitive is the intertidal result to the choice of tide model? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we have used a tide model that's been validated in Australia um, to an accuracy of about 12 centimetres, but we do know there's plenty of places that the tide model doesn't work as well as it should. And so they're often in sort of um, narrow inlets for estuaries, um, areas of sort of really complex complex bathymetry where the tide model doesn't have enough data to produce a good result. So we have um, sort of one bit of work that we're hoping to, to do this year is to sort of experiment with different tide models and sort of try to get good comparisons between them. So we work out the areas that doesn't work. And then from that, perhaps we can start to do things like pull, take, rather than just using one tide model, choose several and then pull out the best result based on the satellite imagery that we've got. And the nice thing is because we have a huge archive of satellite imagery, you can pretty easily test this. You can plug in different models. You can see how well that models the, the change between low tide and high tide and use that to inform your choice of model. So yeah, so a lot of our results are very dependent on the tide modeling and there are many uh, tide models out there. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, there's definitely some really good potential for trying to experiment with new ways and that these things are improving all the time as well. Thanks, Robbie. There have been a couple of questions around storm surges uh, and high astronomical tides. Have you, I guess, can you explain how you are observing those, if you're observing those, and if they're making any difference yeah. to any of your outcomes? Yeah, okay. Um, 
so the, the astronomical tides thing is pretty relevant to this slide. Um, essentially, this blue, these blue lines are the astronomical tide range and the black dots are what the satellite sees. We don't always see the highest astronomical tide um, based on the overpass time of the satellite. So it is, we've often used a, a sort of a concept called the, the highest observed tide, which is the highest tide that the satellite actually sees. And so we have, all of this stuff has been documented for these, um, for along the Australian coastline. So we can, even though we can't get images for those high tides, we can at least look at the map and say, in this location, we know that we, we only capture X percent of the, the astronomical tide range. Storm surges are a bit trickier. Um, the DA Coastlines product, one of the sort of the, the reasons that we've chosen an annual data set, I'll just jump to a coastline here, um, an annual data set rather than a more detailed, um, sort of say every two weeks data set, is that we really, we're interested in long-term change. So we're interested in seeing this sort of long-term trends of coastal erosion or progradation. Um, and we're not, we, we sort of want to find ways to suppress some of that more short-term stuff. So the beach will change dramatically on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on um, storm surges or wave run-up and that kind of thing. We really want to suppress all that sort of very really and just look at the sort of the longer-term changes. So by taking us of an annual compositing approach, we, we essentially suppress all of that variability and get out a signal which is sort of typical of the long-term trend. So we have um, one thing we want to do in the future is that um, while we could, for a lot of the coastline, tide modeling works really well to get rid of some of the variability. For a lot of the other coastline, there's huge changes in beach conditions based on water level height from storm surge. And so if we could incorporate both sort of these non-tidal effects and tidal effects to get a better idea of how high the water was, we could get much more accurate modeling. But for the coastlines application, because we're using these annual composites, we kind of want to get rid of some of that variability. We're quite happy to suppress that from the model because we're interested in the longer term changes. Uh, and I guess if individuals are wanting to apply some of that in maybe a, a more localized area, um, yeah. DEA provides that ability to, you know, maybe bring some that. Someone else asked a question around uh, if the intertidal substrate is really mobile, does that mean the morphological variability is overgeneralized? So I guess in a similar way, that's a yes, but potentially um, the similar um, processing could be applied to a smaller area to look at that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you if you had a nice time series of storm surge um, or other non-tidal water levels, you could easily plug that into our code and get better um, results out. Um, and similarly for the, so the substrate stuff. So yeah, the intertidal models that we produced are for the all of time. So we've we've identified the places that have changed and the morphology isn't right and said that it's not accurate here, but we haven't actually zoomed in on a higher resolution of time for those places. If you were interested in much more up-to-date results, you could look at producing one of these things just for the last five years, for example, or that kind of thing, or even through time and start comparing 3D shape as it shifted across time. Uh, and another question, how did you model between tidal data in different locations? Yeah, okay, so the tide model we have, um, so there's a few different ways of going about tide modeling or, or um, getting tides for satellite images. One way is just to take tides that are actually observed on the landscape at different tidal um, tidal gauges across the continent. And there's there's a whole bunch of them around Australia. That's sort of, that approach doesn't work as well for us because we have images that can be from any location at any time. So we, we really need to find a way that gets uh, estimates of tide for, if you give it a, an X and Y coordinate and a time, we want a tide height for that specific location. So that's why we've used a tidal model rather than tidal observations. And so this tidal model has accuracy I think down to, uh, I can't think of the resolution off the top of my head. I think it's about four kilometers or two kilometers. And so what we've done is we, we model tides for those sort of two kilometer points and then we interpolate between them. So there's a little bit of, um, of smoothing over some of the, the dynamics there, especially in areas which have really complex topography, but we get a, pretty, a sort of a, a pretty decent um, best estimate for how the tide is at a given location, um, even if that's pretty far away from tide modeling stations. Thanks, Ruby. Uh, there's a couple of technology questions. Um, so what software package was used to derive the outputs? So we use um, we use a fully open source set of software. So um, most of our work is done in Python. Um, so we use tools like, um, so the Open Data Cube for a start is an open source Python software that collects and manages the data. We then use tools like X-Ray, which take um, satellite data and organizes it into nice stacks that you can then analyzed by time or tide really easily. 
And we then use um, a whole bunch of other tools from um, the SciPy um, Python environment, which let you do things like um, extract image features from the data, um, classify it, um, extract these co the coastal contours you can see here. So it's a fully open source sort of software. Um, and all of the code um, will be online once our paper is published in, um, in a little while. And so anyone can basically take this code and apply it in their own system with their own satellite data if they want, or use DA data that's already processed and get um, similar results for their area. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, also, a couple of questions around, uh, is the coastline data available to be downloaded? Uh, and yep. is there was another download question, and I've lost it. Well, answer that one, and I'll find the other one. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Um, so if you want to download the data, um, you can just go to Google and search in DA Coastlines. Um, you can go here to the first link. And so this brings up our, um, our Digital Australia metadata page. So there's a whole lot of information, so background to the product here, um, details, so more technical details about all of the different layers and all the different um, features of the data, um, including information on the validation, and importantly, limitations. So this is definitely worth a read if you're going to use this data for analysis, because there's, a, there's some things it's good at doing and things it's less good at doing, and it's just good to have an awareness of that. Um, but on this page too, there is a access link, which then has links to the data. So for download, you can click on that, um, and it will download the data in either Esri format or a geo package, which is an open source format. Um, and if you're code savvy as well, there's also some other options. Rather than downloading the whole data in bulk, you can use um, WFS to load data for your specific location. And there's code examples down here as well on how to do that. So yeah, all the data is freely available. Um, there's lots of metadata available. So yeah, should all be good for anyone who wants to download it. Thanks, Robbie. The other one was, uh, have you derived a scalar intertidal width data set, which would also be available? No, but that would be really cool. Um, yeah, so no, we haven't, we haven't um, sort of tried to vectorize some of the, the intertidal products. Um, the, the problem with trying to drive intertidal widths is that, is that issue of the satellite not always seeing the high and low tide. Um, so there's sort of those, those biases of, we get the elevation numbers themselves, the absolute values are fine, but the extents can be, can be limited by what the satellite sees. But you could always do it by choosing a sort of a consistent tide datum to compare across or something like that. Um, so no, we haven't, but it's the kind of thing you could easily do um, with some of the existing code. Thanks, Robbie. A um, couple of questions around the satellites. So someone asked uh, if the Landsat and the Sentinel satellites pass over at the same time. They do roughly. I think Landsat comes over at about 10.15 in the morning and Sentinel comes across about 11 o'clock. Um, so very similar, but um, so they're both still, they're trying to get nice sunny conditions that have, don't have as much cloud. Um, there, we haven't used Sentinel-2 data as much for these products because there's been problems with the cloud masking. So um, Landsat has some special thermal bands that lets you detect clouds really easily. Sentinel doesn't have them, so it's a bit harder to, to detect clouds. Um, but our sort of hope is that with Sentinel-2 data, there might be a bit of, we might see a little bit of different portion of the tide range um, that we can capture with Landsat. Um, and in the longer run, um, Sentinel-1 radar data might also be really valuable because it um, can pass over later on about 6 p.m. Um, in the evening, which might mean a whole different set of tides are captured, which might solve some of those problems of only seeing a certain tide. Thanks. And a related one, in the DEA platform, is it possible to scroll through the vintages of satellite images? Yep. Um, so I can show you how to do that. So here we can... I'll just show you a simple version. So this is a um, an annual layer. So basically, we we use that geomedian approach I talked I talked to you about before to calculate an annual image. But all of the individual satellite images are also here. Um, so what you can do is you can add this. Just turn off these other layers. See if this works. So here we go. So we've got um, this is an image from 2020. You can go back to 2019, 2018, and you can also scroll through them on this timeline down the bottom. So basically, you can you can scroll through the full archive from 19. I think there's a few images from 1986, mostly from 1987 on, um, and you can get images for any location and date. I'm using this. You can also do it in code too. Um, you can download the whole time series for a certain area and we'll look at it that way too, and make animations and that kind of thing. 
Thanks, Robbie. Uh, and back to another kind of technical question. Could you explain in a little more detail how the shoreline modeling works for mangrove shorelines? Uh, I imagine yeah, okay. having the vegetation in the image complicates the process. What was that? What was that last bit? Uh, does the having the vegetation in the image complicate yeah. the process? Yeah. Okay. So, um, luckily, the the so the process for extracting shorelines along mangrove coastlines is pretty similar to other coastlines. So we we basically convert it into land and water, and because the vegetation has a very different spectral signature, so it reflects light in a very different way, it becomes quite a good contrast between. So you can quite easily um, separate it from water. Um, and the, the other nice thing is that because we're using mean sea level as our tide data, mean sea level generally corresponds with around the front of the mangrove um, forests. So as of, and I'll show you an example here actually. Um, our definition of the front of the mangroves is, is generally pretty close to um, this of the, the mean sea level boundary. So you can see here how we're tracking our mangroves as they've grown out um, in Exmouth Gulf over the last um, 30 years. There are some issues. So at the moment, for this, the first version of Cosines, we're just using a, a quite simple approach to separate land and water. Um, for a future version, we're going to um, use a, a more technical um, approach that will basically try to optimise how we extract, how we separate um, different types of coastal environments from water. So mangroves will have a slightly different spectral signature than white sandy beaches. And so we can sort of tailor our system to get more accurate extractions for the different environments. Um, but that's not currently in this one. This is a, a quite simple approach that does the same applies the same system to all of our different environments. Future versions will have a, sort of a, a more complex version in it. Thanks, Toby. We've got heaps more questions that we're not going to have time <laughs> for, but I might just ask one more. Uh, are there any intentions to run a similar sort of thing through, uh, with the DEA program on, uh, I guess, inland water, like floodplains or any fluvial plains? Yeah, okay. So, so um, this, so this product is, is definitely strictly coastal, um, but one of my colleagues, um, Claire Krauss, is in my um, in my team in DEA, has also been working on a product which is very similar called Digital Earth Australia Water Bodies. Um, so I'll just give you an example here. This is also available in the in the map platform. Um, so what this does is basically it maps water across the continent um, using a, our water observations product. Um, and so then what it lets you do is it lets you zoom into any water body. So here we've got the Manini Lakes. Let's see, click on it, um, and it gives you both the outline of the water body and a time series of how that water body has changed through time. So here you can sort of see we've got um, the Mindy Lakes are quite full up until the Millennium Drought hits, and then they're incredibly empty for uh, most of the Millennium Drought, and then they fill up um, in La Nina flooding in 2011. So this, this data is already processed for every water body. You can sort of compare these different things. You can look at how different water bodies respond differently to flooding. Um, so it's essentially a very similar product just for inland water. It doesn't map the, the, the coastlines, but it does map the time history of how these water bodies have changed through time. Thanks, Robbie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, please join us again next week when Stephen Petkovsky, the curator and manager of the collections team here at Geoscience Australia, will present his uh, speech, The Minerals to Meteorites, a journey into the national mineral and fossil collection and recent activities. Uh, the presentation will delve into the amazing specimens held within the collection, as well as the collection team's recent achievements and their diverse stakeholders. So thanks again, Robbie. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, and feel free to reach out to the DEA team. Uh, if you go to the GEA website, uh, you should be able to find the DEA site from there uh, or through the links that we provided throughout the um, presentation chat today. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.